says, what will happen to that cell if it is placed in a solution of 0.1% NaCl? Is the solution hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic relative to the cytoplasm? And then will the gram-positive cell respond in the same way? I don't want you to answer the question just yet. What I want you to start with is take a minute with a partner and list out what do you need to know to be able to answer this question? So what concepts do you need to understand? All right, let's list. What do we need to know in, in order to answer this question? What was that, Alana? OK, so in terms of tonicity, we'll just kind of we'll, we'll start with that. Uh, so what does hypotonic, what does hypertonic, what does isotonic mean? Not only what they mean, but also, um, well, I'll stop there right now. Other ones, other concepts. That's it. Okay. What in particular is important here? Good. this as water movement or osmosis, yeah. Osmotic pressure, osmosis, etc. Anything else? Let's start there. Um, and let's just start with some definitions. What does it mean for a solution to be isotonic? Or what does it mean for two solutions to be isotonic? One. Okay, good. They have the same concentration of a solute, right? And usually when we're talking about this, we're talking about aqueous solutions, ones that water is the main solvent. If a solution is hypertonic, that means what about it? Higher concentrations or lower concentrations of solute? Higher. Hypotonic would mean lower. Now, I, I want to point out here that these are comparison terms. Okay, so hypertonic, you have to say which is hypertonic. In this particular problem, where we have a cell with 0.9% NaCl, and the solution is 0.1%, which is hypertonic relative to the other? The cell's hypertonic, meaning what about the solution? And that's a higher time. Oh, the solution has is hypotonic? Perfect. Okay, so the solution then is hypotonic. hypotonic. Um, okay. Across, uh, describe to me the structure of the phospholipid bilayer and properties of that phospholipid bilayer. So let's just start listing some properties of something we've talked a bit about already. And I promise I won't make you all stand in a corner again today like we did last Friday. Go ahead. Okay, tails are hydrophobic. Beautiful. 
So hydrophilic heads made out of phosphate, maybe some other hydrophilic molecules as well attached to it. Middle, hydrophobic. What are turn what does this these structural characteristics, what are the properties or features then that are attributed to phospholipid bilayers based on this property? We describe it as a semi-permeable or a selectively permeable barrier. What is, it, what is allowed to move through a phospholipid bilayer and what is not allowed to move through a bilayer? Like Okay, so small non-charged molecules can, large charged ones, either of those properties cannot. Perfect. What's the property of water? Would water be able to pass through? Maybe at a low frequency. Maybe at a low frequency. But most often, how does water make its way in and out of cells? Or how do... How does sodium, how, does, how do other types of charged molecules make their way through the phospholipid bilayer? Protein channels. Protein channels. Or in this case, we might refer to those on the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria as porin proteins, but protein channels. The main water protein channel is known as aquaporin. And it's involved in passive diffusion. What does passive diffusion mean? What was that, Allie? No energy required, exactly. Sometimes you might see the term facilitated. It means what it, both of those are forms of uh, molecule movement across the membrane through a channel. It doesn't require energy. The difference between the two of them is a passive channel just remains the same, same shape as a molecule is moving through it and facilitated that transporter actually changes a little bit. Um, but the distinction is really small. This is in opposition to active transport, which requires energy, typically in the form of what? Typically in the form of ATP. There are exceptions, though, and we'll see some exceptions later on, either today or, or down the road. Um, aquaporin, as I said, is passive doesn't require any, any energy. Sodium, on the other hand, typically it's active transport. Okay, so sodium typically is one that would require some sort of active transport. We're only going to focus on the movement of water here. Okay, we'll only focus on movement of water. Um, okay, so let's go to the next step. You got a cell. Again, 0.9% NaCl, solution, 0.1% NaCl, what's moving? Water, what direction? This is where a lot of people got tricked up. I'd say about 50% of the class said it moves into the cell, and about the other 50% said it moves out. So we need to pay attention here on where the concentrations are, but we also need to think about, it, it, I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep concentration in mind. What, typically, when molecules diffuse, they move from higher low to lower high. High to low. Typically, concentration of, of molecules move from high concentrations to low concentrations. In this case, that would mean the sodium would move, if the sodium chloride can move, it would move out of the cell, right? So that there's equilibrium across the membrane. Where does the water move? So where will the water go? In this case, it's going to move into the cell. Okay? So here's one way to think about this. There are, there are two 
frames of reference for this. One, some folks will say water is going to move from where there is less solute to where there is higher concentrations of solute. That's one way to describe it. The other way to describe it is in terms of free water. So let me give an example. Let's say that we have, let's say this is uh, sodium or sodium chloride, and this is the 0.9% solution. And then we'll make blue water molecules. And I'm going to draw 10 water molecules. Sodium chloride, when it's in solution, dissolves into sodium ions and chloride ions. What will those be, uh, how will they interact with water? So how do sodium and chloride ions interact with water? What's the charge on sodium? Plus chloride negative. Water is polar. Where are their partial positive and partial negative charges? Okay, good. Oxygen has a partial negative on it. Hydrogens have partial positives. And you may remember one of the things we talked about is in solution, water is going to form these hydration shells around polar molecules or around charged molecules. In other words, in these cases here, these water molecules are not free. They're actually interacting, and we'll just draw one interaction for each. They're interacting with sodium or chloride. Uh, where's this one going to interact? There. In this case, in the 0.9% solution, as we've drawn it right now, every single one of them is bound up with sodium. There's no free water. What about over here? So what's happening in this scenario? Lots of free water, little free water, more, less than in the 0.9% solution? More. So in this case, the concentration of free water Water that's not being, uh, that's not involved in hydrogen bonding or interactions with sodium chloride is much higher in the 0.1% solution. If we look at it that way, then this agrees with what we know about the fusion. Water moves from higher concentrations to areas of lower concentrations. I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions on that concept. Okay, given that, talk with somebody else. What's going to happen to this cell? And reminder, it's a eukaryotic red blood cell. Bless you. All right, so what's going to happen? What happens to this red blood cell? I know some people have the right answer. I can tell you that. I looked at everybody's response. It's going to swell. Anybody disagree with that? How do we test that? Don't just believe me on how do we actually test that? Has anybody done this experiment before? Can you guys, can you do it in 155 or anything? Isn't that, it's something with like a, something that goes like this and then there's... Oh, 
that, that is an osmotic pressure, but how could you test whether the red blood cells are actually going to swell? I mean, the, yes, that, that does exist, and that's not what we're looking at here, per se. I want to go to this model. The way you can do this is take red blood cells, take your own if you want to, but I've used sheep blood cells because they're cheap and they're not mine. Um, I'm, I'm selfish about that. Uh, stick it in pure water. Okay, and then let it sit for a while and observe. What would the observation be? If we were to stick red blood cells in pure water and then come back 10 minutes later and look at them under a microscope, what would we see? What was that? Okay, so swelling possibly. Any other hypotheses? Grace? They could burst too. We used to play this, so I, I'll explain the story in a minute. But first, let's watch. What would happen if we put it in a hypertonic solution? So like one molar sodium chloride. They'd shrivel off, or they'd crinate, is the other term. All right, so let's see. All right, so. Um, Isotonic solution, red blood cells under a microscope. Now they're being put into a hypertonic solution. I'll move that so you can read the bottom there. And note the time. This is a quick lapsed video. Back into isotonic. and now distilled water. Holy crap, where'd they go? Holy crap. All right, so we have two different phenotypes here. Some that end up, no, we don't want to watch eicosmosis. Some that end up completely bursting, and then others that kind of like all of a sudden disappear. Why did they disappear? Really, what happens is the membrane becomes so weak that they just kind of lightly explode, I suppose is one way to describe it. Okay? So when I was um, teaching at St. Norbert, we used to do this as like an introductory bio lab. The way that we would do it is we'd tell students you have one molar sodium chloride, 0.9%, and a 0.1% solution. Take red blood cells, mix it, let it sit for 10 minutes, look at it under a microscope. And they'd be able to identify the red blood cells in the hypertonic solution. They all are shriveled up. In the isotonic solution, they look like red blood cells. And then they'd get to the 0.1% solution, and they would freak out. They'd go, I can't see anything. And so me being the instructor would just say, well, why is that? You must have screwed up. You should try it again. And we'd see how many times we could play that trick on them, like just getting them to redo the slides over and over again. It's because they've all bursted by the time that they're looking at them under the microscope. Okay? Why? Why do they burst? The water's coming in. Membranes don't have the ability to resist the expansion of water coming into the cell. So if that solution outside of the cell remains hypotonic relative to the cell, water keeps rushing in. And that cell will increase in size, increase in size, and explode. Okay? Um, Let's draw an analogy here real quick. So over the weekend, this weekend, because I have nothing else to do, um, I'm going to do an experiment. I am going to take a balloon. I'm going to blow it up. That's a really crappy balloon. Looks like a whale, actually. But, And then I'm going to take another balloon. But before I blow it up, I'm going to stick it in a 2-liter soda bottle. and blow it up. What's going to happen in each of these cases? If I just 
keep blowing up the one on top. What's going to happen eventually? It'll burst. That's like a red blood cell with a hypotonic solution. What's going to happen to the bottom one? What does this have anything to do with microbiology? What's true about a gram-positive cell? What's the structure of a gram-positive cell envelope? It's got an inner, it's got a cell membrane. What does it have outside of that? Thick peptidal glycan. Imagine this here, this bottle is your thick peptidal glycan. The balloon is your cell membrane. What's going to happen as, in this case, air, but as water keeps rushing into the cell? What happens? That membrane will start to push against the walls of the peptidal glycan, and at that point, does it burst? No, there's a limit to how far it can expand, right? Um, this is analogous to what we see with plant cells. So if you stick celery in water, does celery explode? That'd be really cool, but it doesn't, right? It just becomes more crisp. The turgor pressure that builds up inside of it, uh, the cells have cell walls that allow for that membrane to expand, but there's a point at which the expansion can't occur any further because the cell wall is preventing that expansion from taking place. Same thing is true with the gram-positive cell. So if you're looking for, to complete this answer then, what we're looking for is that gram, eukaryotic cells will explode. Gram-positive cells, on the other hand, they'll expand to a point, but it's not enough to cause them to end up lysing or bursting. There are exceptions to this. There are exceptions to this. Um, maybe we'll come back to one of those in a minute. Questions? Grace, go ahead. Ah, that is a great question. What do you think? How would a gram negative behave? Why do you think so? I could see that argument. I, I could, I don't know, actually, I, I don't totally know the answer to that one. Um, I should probably do that experiment. I'm going to bet that for the reason that you said, gram-negative cells have a thinner peptidal glycan. They can probably still resist for a period of time, but they probably can't, it, they're going to explode sooner than a gram-positive cell would because that turgor pressure, if it continues to build, would be too much. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's what we see in nature, is that if you were to take like gram-positive and gram-negative cells, stick them, stick them side by side into water, Gram positive survive longer in that condition than gram negatives do. Yeah. Now that kind of brings up a point. So I don't know the answer. Uh, it's very possible on an exam question. I don't know the answer. Okay. But you ended up using logic based on what we've talked about, right? You use the evidence that gram negative cells have a thinner layer. Given what we know about gram positives, thinner layer might not allow for repressing that trigger pressure as well. That's a great answer, okay? So the point here just being you don't have to necessarily be right to get the credit on the question, all right? Use logic, use evidence based on what we've talked about throughout the semester so far. Other questions? Okay, let's try something real quick. Um, what do I want to do? There we go. So what I ended up doing last night, so I got bored. Okay, so this should post at some point today if it's not already. Um, here is the question, and this is very small, so I'm going to copy and paste this real quick. 
Um, but here is a sample answer. This is nobody's from this class. This is kind of like an amalgamation of responses that I saw. Okay. So it says, the answer to that question that we just looked at, it's, this one says, the 0.1% NaCl solution is hypotonic. Water will move into a red blood cell because the concentration is higher inside the cell. The red blood cell will degrade. A gram-positive bacteria will not burst because it has a thick peptidoglycan. What I want you to do in a couple of minutes, take a look at this and spend a minute thinking to yourself first and then talk it through with somebody else. What's good in this answer? What needs improvement? Okay, so what's good and what needs improvement? Isis is an important piece here that's missing. Okay, so why? Alan? Okay, other ones? Katie? Bingo. That's a really important one. I think that um, oftentimes will be missed. So when you're talking about concentration, in reference to what? Are you talking about the, in this case, it would be the salt concentration, right? But being, sh being clear with what you're explaining is another key piece here. Other things that are missing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So the red, and, and I'll point out another one here too, but why that red blood cell would burst. So you might use terms like uh, movement of water, osmosis. Those would be key terms. I think the other thing here is degrade isn't exactly the most specific of terminology, and that's not really what happens. The cell bursts or it lyses would be the other term that we use. Um, and you'll see this term often, lysis, or uh, as the process, or the cell lyses. There we go. What else is missing? There's at least one other thing in here that is missing. Take a look at the first sentence. What did we say about terms like hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic? It's a comparison. So to say that the 0.1% solution is hypotonic relative to what? 0.1% okay. sodium chloride solution is hypotonic relative to the cytoplasm of the cell or in comparison to the cytoplasm of the cell. Those seem to be the main things that are missing. Okay. Um, the reason why I want to go through, I wanted to take the time to go through this and to kind of point out some of these is Usually after the first exam, I will get questions like, well, why is this wrong? Or what's missing from it? Typically, it's the details, okay? And again, one of the things that I'm trying to stress in here is you don't need to know the definite, you don't need to be able to define for me the definition of, of a word. You need to be able to use it appropriately when talking about, in this case, microbiology. So using selective terminology that provides detail like lysis or de defining hypotonic of the, the tonicity of the two solutions or talking about water movement or osmosis into the cell through aquaporins, those are all kind of really nice details that you can add to help explain the answer. Okay. Um, I'll pause. Questions? Practice this one on your own again. Not right now, but over the weekend, take some time to rework this problem. You don't have to hand it in or anything, um, but just get some practice with trying to write this out. Beyond that, one of the things I asked for feedback on like how things are going so far, and I got some really good comments. One of the things that um, I immediately ended up doing last night was... So you'll see in the future, um, all of these now have the date that we're doing these lectures listed. Um, I know that wasn't up there before, so this might help with organization a little bit. Um, and then I just wanted to remind folks too, 
you can find the due dates for everything right up here in the calendar, okay? If this doesn't work for you, let me know. I have done this a different way. I'm just trying this this semester because I thought it would be easier in the long run as I run this course, but if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. The one thing that um, maybe is more of a personal concern than anything else, a lot of people said, yeah, things are going okay right now. I'm keeping up with everything. One thing that I'm not hearing that I'd like to, I didn't explicitly ask for it, but are you spending time with the review questions. So are you spending time practicing writing essays or talking them out or working with somebody else through them? And the answer may be yes, the answer may be you know, I'm not gonna ask you right now. But that's something to start thinking about. When it comes to the exam, those types of questions, they carry half of the points. Okay, so it's just as important to spend time with information before class and reviewing some of what we're talking about, but also really important to spend time writing down answers or talking out answers with somebody else if you're somebody who's more of an audio learner than, a, than somebody who writes necessarily, okay? So take the time to do that. Usually what I tell students who are asking, um, how should I study for the exam? Here's my thought. Spend an hour before each class, maybe an hour and a half. I don't know how long it takes. Uh, listening to the mini lecture, doing the homework, getting prepped for class. And then after class, between today and Monday, spend an hour reviewing what we talked about today. Do some of the review problems, okay? If you, I don't have keys to them, and the reason why I do that is intentional, um, because I don't want you memorizing the answers. That's not, that's really not the goal of this. The goal is to, for you to be able to explain it in your own terms. Um, but if you want to come and talk to them, about them with me, I'm more than happy to sit down with you and review them, okay? So start taking some time doing that. All right, the last thing I wanted to finish up with today um, is to just a couple of things from uh, that I think we've spent some time on already, but... Hmm. Phospholipid bilayer, temperature, we've talked about water movement. Okay. Um, this slide is a bit tricky, and I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about these types of active transport. The main takeaway point is it requires energy. But as I mentioned, ATP isn't the only form of energy here. So let's take a look at a different example and talk about active and passive transport. One of the things that we will begin to look at in the next few weeks um, is metabolism. How do bacteria produce energy? One of the main components in this production of energy is respiration through the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Um, so here is a membrane, and here are a variety of proteins that are found within that membrane that are required for transporting electrons. Now anybody know what happens as those electrons move? What else moves? So here's a very rough sketch of the electron transport chain. So electrons move, ATP synthases over here, hydrogens move out of the cell, come back into the cell, that produces energy. Here's what I want you to do. Given the context of this problem, um, what I want you to do is identify for me where is their active transport and where is their passive transport in this model here. 
So where are there molecules moving across the membrane that requires active transport? Where are there molecules moving across the membrane that requires passive transport? Okay. Um, take about three to four minutes. Talk this one through. Justify your answers. Okay. What are you using as contextual clues here? And then we'll spend the last eight minutes or so discussing this. So what are some features of active transport? ATP. ATP is one, an ADP, being made or being used? Being used, right? So energy being used. What's another feature? One of the main features of active transport are molecules moving against their concentration gradient. We've already said that for water, for example, water can passively diffuse across the membrane through, through channel proteins. But some molecules are, we, bacterial cells in this case, um, will actively transport into the cell or actively transport out of the cell against their concentration gradient. Instead of going from high to low concentration, it's forcing it low to high. Okay. How about passive transport? No energy, with or against concentration gradient? With. So taking a look at this problem then, what's moving across the membrane? What was that? Sorry. Hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are moving across the membrane. What's the concentration of hydrogen ions outside of the cell? pH of 6, right? Inside the cell to pH of 7. Which one has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions? So what's the relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration? As, some, as pH drops, things become more acidic, and that correlates with higher concentrations of hydrogen ions. So in this case here, the hydrogen ion concentration is actually greater outside of the cell. So out here, than it is inside of the cell. So are those hydrogen ions moving with or against their concentration gradient? They're moving against. What's our energy, though? It's not ATP the electrons. The electrons have high energy here. And we'll come back to this concept a little bit later. Okay? So this is to point out that, that ATP doesn't have to be the energy source. Most often it is, but it doesn't have to be the source of energy here for, for active transport. So this main process of the electron transport chain this here, active transport. As those electrons are moving from one complex to the next, it really, those electrons are releasing energy. That provides energy to move hydrogen from inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Now hydrogen comes back in. It comes back in through ATP synthase. Now it's going from high concentrations to low concentrations, active or passive transport. In this case, it's passive. And the energy that actually is gained from this passive movement based on uh, charges and stuff, that's what leads to the formation of ATP here. Okay? So we see a lot of examples of active and passive transport. We'll, we'll come back to this particular one. But again, the main things to keep in mind, with or against concentration gradient, requiring or not requiring energy are the major components that we should pay, be paying attention to. Any questions on this or the, the concepts of transport molecules? Okay, let me take a couple of minutes to um, recap then this week and then take a couple of minutes to, to just show you the homework real quick. So the main thing this week has been structure and function. Okay, what are things that we've talked about? I guess, what was the theme for Monday? If we could summarize Monday's class, what did we focus on? 
I know, it's a long time ago. What's that? Structure of bacterial cells. And, and what's inside a bacterial cell, right? What's a flagella and what's it used for? What does it look like? Uh, nucleoid versus nucleus, et cetera. What was Wednesday's major theme? Gram staining, correlation between that and the envelope, so the inner and outer membranes, peptidoglycan, some other characteristic differences between gram positives and negatives, like the tachoic acid or lipopolysaccharide. And then today, well, all we have to do is go back to nope. Let's go back to here. So today's goal or today's objective was evaluate how the structure of the phospholipids and membrane proteins affect movement of molecules across the cell membrane of a prokaryotic cell. And we covered that with two questions. One, a question on water movement, and two, a question on movement of hydrogen ions across the membrane, okay? Um, so keep these, keep these objectives in mind as you are prepping. What you'll see in Blackboard is that each of the review questions has a number listed after it. That number indicates which objective it's targeting, okay? And that's a way that you can kind of keep yourself on track. For... Um, Monday's homework, it is a voice thread. Um, so I, I'm not going to signify who in the group has to create it. Just whoever is first to log on to voice thread in your group, make sure that you just share it with everybody immediately. Okay? Um, this one is based on dichotomous keys. We're going to spend one day talking about classification of bacteria. The major goal here is to prep us for how do we design dichotomous keys, how do we read them, and use that information to identify bacteria. The dichotomous keys you have to create as practice I don't want to listen to me. Okay, so everybody in the group should choose one of these categories. You can categorize modes of transport, or candy, or drinks, or sports, or fruits. And you have to use, create a dichotomous key using yes or no questions to distinguish these from any of the other things on this list. Okay? So make sure that you, I think a couple of things here, maybe communication by email with the group to make sure nobody's overlapping on using the same thing. Okay? Uh, you can get creative with this. There were some really awesome ones last year, like uh, in this one. Which one is related to Beyonce? Lemonade would be the correct answer. Okay. Uh, so be creative with it. Have fun with it. All right? That's all I've got. Have a great weekend. I'll see you all on Monday.